Welcome to the Aspen Institute's McCloskey Speaker Series program featuring Elizabeth Colbert, Pulitzer Prize winning author and staff writer at The New Yorker. I'm Crystal Logan, Vice President of Aspen Community Programs here at the Aspen Institute, and I want to thank uh, Bonnie and Tom McCloskey for supporting this program. Thanks to our audience for tuning in for this important conversation. As I introduce our guests today, you'll find links to their bios in the chat. And if you'd like to ask questions, you may type those into the Q&A feature at any time during the event. Elizabeth Colbert is author of Field Notes from a Catastrophe, Man, Nature, and Climate Change, and The Sixth Extinction, for which she won the Pulitzer Prize. Her new book, under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future, published in February, um, is an editor's pick on Amazon, I just noticed today, and also is one of the best books of 2021 so far on Amazon. It's a fascinating read. Uh, I can't get the visuals out of my mind of the Asian carp and the, the cane toads. It's really, really great. Uh, for her work at The New Yorker, where she's been a staff writer since uh, 1999, she's won uh, two National Magazine Awards and the Blake Dodd Prize from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Uh, Greg Gershoni is our moderator today. Uh, he is the executive director of the Aspen Institute's uh, Energy and Environment Program. Prior to joining the Institute, he served in the US Department of Energy, uh, where he worked on clean energy and uh, energy security policy. He also served in the White House uh, for five years under President Obama, where he was the Director of Energy and Environment for the Office of Presidential Personnel. We are thrilled and honored to feature you both here today. Thanks for joining us. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Greg. Thank you. Thanks, Crystal, um, and thanks to the Aspen Community Program for putting on um, this speaker series with Elizabeth Colbert. Um, I had the chance to read um, Under a White Sky while sitting in the mountains of North Carolina earlier this spring, um, and so I'm really excited to talk with you today about the, the fundamental question at the core of this book, which is, um, to what extent have humans changed our own environment, and should we continue to do so to try to fix the many problems that we've created for ourselves um, and all the other living creatures that we, we share the planet with. Um, there's, you know, it, it makes me think of the old saying, if you find yourself in a hole, first step is to stop digging. But um, at the, you know, at the start of your book, you use a phrase to describe what the US Army Corps of Engineers works on, like what a lot of their projects are, which is backward looping second order efforts. Um, and that really stuck with me, um, you know, and it's used in the context of efforts that have been made in Southwest uh, of Chicago, of reversing a river um, and building an underwater electric fence. And, and also in, in Southern Louisiana, um, which is facing more and more flooding um, and, and sedimentary loss, you know, how, so how did we get here and what can we do to avoid, you know, unf unfortunate things like this in the future? Well, how we got here is, you know, sort of the history of <laughs> modern society. Um, you know, we, em we embarked on this effort to change the world to suit ourselves. And in some ways we did it consciously, you know, that what, you, what sort of by implication is a first order Army Corps of Engineers project is, is many of the really vast engineering projects that made the U.S. what it is today, uh, the Bonneville Dam, you know, controlling our, all of our major rivers are basically dammed up and they are for flood control purposes and for hydropower. Um, so we really, you know, set out in a, in a sort of extension of manifest destiny to, to re-engineer the country. Let's just talk about the U.S. now, but it can be extended globally at this point uh, to, to suit our own our own needs and our own purposes. And that was a very, there was a, you know, a century and a half, let's say a very um, exuberant and bold engineering projects of which the reversal of the Chicago River, which is the example that starts the book is, is really uh, a, a pioneering, but also sort of emblematic of those, those, those efforts. 
And then what we find it now, having, having done all that, is in many of those projects we now realize have had very significant environmental impacts uh, that we now have to deal with um, or should or want to deal with, I should say. Um, and then there are the inadvertent ways that we realize that we're re-engineering the entire planet, you know, which as no one knows better than you, you know, climate change was not something we set out to do, but it was a byproduct. And a lot of these, uh, a lot of our activities have had these unintended consequences of just sort of willy-nilly terraformed, you know, the planet. Uh, in ways that we now are realizing are pretty dangerous, very dangerous. So I, 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 I can't really be overstated in the summer of 2021. Yeah, and I mean, I think we're seeing um, the impacts of that, whether it's, uh, you know, 116 degrees in, in the Pacific Northwest, the droughts and the, uh, you know, we're seeing unprecedented droughts in the West, um, fires forming in Canada, you know, heat records being set. Um, with, with you know the uh, the 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 remnants of the hurricane are going to be passing through DC this afternoon where where I am. Um, you spent some time in southern Louisiana, uh, you know, at the at the tip of the Mississippi River. Were the people who are living there, you know, who who were who are losing land, you know, every year to to the seas to the river? Um, like, what are how are they thinking about this in terms of you know, what they should do, how they can prevent their houses from being destroyed the next time a, a big hurricane comes through? Well, the fight for, you know, Southern Louisiana, which is this three century long fight that began as really as soon as the French settled in this impossible part of the world, really, where uh, basically where the Mississippi hits the Gulf, um, that was a very in geological terms is a really temporary arrangement. I mean, the Mississippi has flopped around many times since the end of the last ice age. And that's really why we have the whole Mississippi Delta. The Mississippi would, you know, hit the Gulf, it would drop its sediment, it would lay down this lobe, it's called a Delta lobe. And then it would decide, well, it's gotten too steep now, let's move somewhere else. And it would lay down another lobe. And, um, so Louisiana's, uh, New Orleans is built on, on a lobe that's, I think it's around 5,000 years old and it's sinking. Uh, and it was really, um, you know, if you, if you had come in with a knowledge of, of the geological history of the place, uh, you would have said, wow, this is a really dangerous place to put a city. But they put a city there in 1718 and they were immediately flooded out and they immediately started to wall up the Mississippi, to levy up the Mississippi the, already when the, when the French were in control. And that project is now, you know, of, of such epic proportions. Anyone who's been to New Orleans who knows, you know, that when you go down to the river, you're looking up at the river, you know, New Orleans is below the river, you're looking up the levee to the river, um, knows how incredibly uh, monumental that project has been. And I think that, you know, every time there's a disaster, and that includes after Katrina, after which billions of dollars were spent on new, incredibly massive works. Once again, if you go down there, you can see them. They're, they're really, you know, pharaonic um, to try to correct for the pro problems that had, you know, helped contribute to the disaster that was Katrina. Um, every time we go through this new round of engineering, and I think there is a sense that this is reaching the end, uh, we're reaching the end of the line. Now, I don't know that that has, I don't know, you know, the average person in New Orleans, when you're, New Orleans, when you're in New Orleans, it, it seems, you know, well, we're in New Orleans, we're, you know, it's, it's, it's a great city, everyone loves New Orleans, uh, everyone wants to live there. Um, but if you talk to sort of the engineers, even the, you know, the projects that were done after Katrina, which were just finished, you know, a few years ago, they're sinking already. And so they're no longer even up to the standard of trying to protect the city from a hurricane, a category five storm. And that, I don't think we can keep doing that. I think that people recognize that we can't keep doing that. It's just not physically possible. And so now we're looking at new sorts of manipulation, one of which you know, I write about in the book, which is trying to 
get some of the sediment that should, in a, if we hadn't levied up the, of the Mississippi, it would be flowing over the landscape, it would be rebuilding the land, trying to divert some of that sediment and onto, into some of these shallow bays to rebuild some of the land around New Orleans. But you can't let the Mississippi flood New Orleans. I mean, that just doesn't work for obvious reasons. So we're in a, in a really serious bind here. And um, I think that it will, you know, it will be a very bad and sad and disastrous day when people say, well, we're just giving up on New Orleans. But between now and then, there will be, the city will become more and more sort of a citadel it will just be surrounded by these huge earthworks. Um, and we'll see if that uh, actually survives. And you have to think, you know, I mean, people walking around New Orleans and the surrounding areas and seeing this and, um, you know, kind of having a sense that this is happening. But, but meanwhile, in Chicago, probably very few people that live there know that, you know, a, a river was reversed, that, you know, we, it, it, it was you know, the flow of a river was changed. Um, and then that created another problem of the invasive species. And now that, you know, and so I guess how, um, how, how do you view something like that, which is, I mean, the, if New Orleans is the continuation of that original project that keeps causing problems, but Chicago is, you know, you kind of, they, they added on the electric fence in a river to keep fish out from going the other way because the river was reversed. You know, how do how do how do we how do we deal with things like that? Well, we are, um, you know, one way to deal with them. I mean, I think the re the, cre the reason why I, I I think that the story of the Chicago River is really emblematic, even if it's not the most significant story in the book. And may maybe I should just briefly tell the story for those who are not Chicagoans is. The story is that the Chicago River, um, which is a you know piddling little river uh, as rivers go, um, it has two branches, a north, south, and, a, and a, a north branch and a south branch. It comes together and then it flows east. It flowed east into Lake Michigan. And Chicago grew up around this river. It dumped all of its sewage into the river. It really needed the river and has its immense stockyards around Chicago. Uh, grew up, all the animal waste, everything went into the river. And the river was uh, so clogged with waste, it was said a chicken could walk across it without ever getting her feet wet. And that has obvious problems because Chicago gets its drinking water from Lake Michigan. So the waste was flowing into Lake Michigan and the drinking water was flowing out, coming out. And there was a lot of you know, waterborne disease. And at the turn of the 19th century, it was decided that something had to be done about it, that something was this enormous construction project which literally reversed the flow of the Chicago River now flows away from Lake Michigan. There's locks on the lake and the river flows away west into the Des Plaines River, into the, which flows into the Illinois River and eventually into the Mississippi. And that solved the drinking water problem. That's really why Chicago can still draw its drinking water from Lake Michigan, but it connected the Great Lakes Basin, this whole huge freshwater basin with another huge freshwater drainage basin, the Mississippi drainage basin. And over the course of the 20th century, both of these basins became highly invaded. The, the um, Great Lakes, once we built the St. Lawrence Seaway, became one of the most invaded water systems in the world, really cascading an ecological you know, disaster. And, um, when Asian carp arrived in Mississippi, that's a whole other story, but Asian carp, you know, are sort of notorious and notorious invasive species, there's actually four species. Uh, people in the Great Lakes, around the Great Lakes Society, really don't want these fish in the Great Lakes. And they demanded basically that, there, that this connection be cut, this connection between the Mississippi and the Great Lakes be cut. And studies were done, can we cut it? Can we cut it? Can we undo what we did? Which is the logical thing to do. Okay, we connect them. Let's see if we can unconnect them. But so much infrastructure had grown up around that. And we are so averse to that kind of change that it was decided it was just politically impossible to sever these two basins now. So something had to be imposed. Some sort of new control had to be imposed on the old 
And that was these electric barriers that you refer to, which are supposed to, uh, they're just pulsing a lot of water through the canal that connected these, the, that, that reversed the river. They, they reversed the river by digging this long canal. Um, and if you stick your hand in or jump in or whatever, you, you will get electrocuted. Uh, and this electricity is supposed to, when, the, when a fish arrives, it's supposed to get a shock. It's supposed to decide in this you know, little fish brain to turn around and go the other way. But you know, whether that's effective or not, no one really knows. Um, and there's now another barrier being planned further south that will have noise, underwater noise and jets of uh, bubbles. It's been described to me as a disco barrier. It has a price tag of about a billion dollars and it's very much in the works. If, 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 this, if the Army can, Corps of Engineers can get a congressional appropriation, it will build that new barrier. Fascinating. Um, well, let's turn from the water to the air. Um, you know, we, we often hear about companies that offset their emissions, whether it's, um, you know, through investing in a solar project or credits for, um, uh, you know, maintaining forests. Um, but you, you got to see where the emissions that you pay to uh, offset reside. Can you tell us about the, the facility in Iceland and, and what that is and, and what you saw there? Yeah, sure. So this is, um, you know, it, one way to describe it would even be beyond offsets. I mean, offsets are a, a troubled category. We, we can talk about that if people are interested, but, you know, the idea is, well, I'm putting a bunch of carbon into the air and I will um, invest in some project that prevents carbon from going into the air. So like, as you say, a solar farm or a forest, you know, keeping that forest intact. They're very troubled though, because it's hard to know whether, you know, was that forest gonna get cut down if I didn't do this? And they don't really directly offset your emissions. So if you really want to, uh, you know, negate your emissions, you've got to take them out of the air. And that is what this project in Iceland is doing. They're doing um, what's called carbon dioxide removal, which is actually sucking CO2 out of the air. Um, and they do that by, in these machines that look like sort of giant air conditioners and inside the machines are chemicals that bind with CO2. And then they uh, heat the chemicals up using Iceland's geothermal energy from you know, deep inside the earth. And then they store that CO2, they recycle the chemicals, and then they also shove the CO2 deep inside the earth where it can reacts with Iceland's volcanic rock to form calcium carbonate. So it's a very uh, elegant uh, project and it's, it's gotten a lot of press and a lot of attention. It's expanded since I was there about a year ago. Um, and the reason that it is so popular is when, you know, I'm sure people in the audience have heard this term net zero. If you want to reach net zero emissions, that means that whatever goes up there has to be countered, not, not by some you know, sort of offset, but by sucking the CO2 out of the air. So carbon dioxide removal is uh, a very, very big topic these days. And a lot of company and a lot of companies, a lot of venture capital is going in to try to be the next best, you know, the next big thing. Because uh, there's a sense that we've got to do this. We've already put so much CO2 into the air that we really have to start taking it out. And it's a huge, huge issue. Now, I, I love the analogy used in the, in the book about the bathtub. Um, can, you, can you talk about that, you know, uh, kind of how the earth is a bathtub and we keep adding more, more water to it without letting any out? Yeah, so I think one of the things that's really important to understand about climate change you know, people realize, um, I mean, but, you know, concern people when I say people, obviously there are a lot of people, we'll, we'll put them on the other side, to the side for a moment who deny climate change, but, you know, carbon dioxide, it's a greenhouse gas, you put it up there. Uh, it, the more you put up there, the warmer the world is going to get. But the thing that's important to understand is that, is that Climate change is not a problem like a lot of other environmental problems. Like, for example, when we decided we wanted to attack smog, 
you know, and had cat, put catalytic converters on people's cars. And in relatively short amount of time, the air cleared up. Um, climate change is not like that. It is a cumulative problem. Uh, you put CO2 up there, unless you deploy massive amounts of carbon dioxide removal, it's going to stay there. For all intents and purposes, it's up there forever. And so um, the reason it's compared to a bathtub is, and, and this gets to the whole idea of, of net zero, even if you were to reduce emissions very dramatically, let's say you were to have them, then the atmosphere would still continue to fill with CO2. It would just fill twice as slowly. It's not as if you would be solving the problem. You would simply be slowing down uh, the uh, worsening of the problem. I, I guess that's not really English, but that's what would be happening. Um, and the point is, if you want the bathtub not to overflow, and in this case, overflow means sort of disastrous climate change, you've got to turn the tap off entirely. And that's why we get to this idea of net zero. You've got to have everything you're go that's going into the tub has got to be balanced by something coming out of the tub. And and so like the the idea of getting to zero or to net zero, I mean, from all the things that you've seen, do you do you think that we as a species are heading in that direction? Do we have, I mean, if, I guess if, if, the, if the solution to the Chicago River is the electric fence because it's not politically feasible to re-reverse the river, do we have the political will or the, you know, the societal will to, to reduce emissions to the extent that we need to? That's the, you know, $64 quadrillion question. Um, you know, if you look at the um, data, you would say, uh, I don't think so. I mean, um, the first big set of climate negotiations were held in 1992, okay, so almost 30 years ago. And that was in Rio and that led to this agreement, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which every country in the world, including the US, signed on to under George H.W. Bush uh, to avoid what's called dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate, in the climate system. In the last 30 years, so since that Framework Convention was signed, half of the CO2 since the start of the Industrial Revolution has been put into the air. So our emissions have skyrocketed in the time since we all agreed <laughs> we really shouldn't be doing this. So it's very hard to look at the actual emissions data and draw a great deal of um, you know, comfort from that. Now, that being said, I do think you know, the politics, you know, politics have a way of surprising you. Uh, and once something gets going, uh, things can happen very fast. And as we see the damage mount, you know, perhaps we will get our act together uh, and do something. One hopeful sign, which people point to, and which I agree is a very hopeful sign, is that the cost of various forms of carbon-free energy, for example, solar and wind, those are the two biggies, has really come down radically in the last, just in the last 10 years. So what seemed sort of economically impossible maybe 10 or 20 years ago now seems economically feasible. But the practicalities of it, the practicalities of this energy transition, which you know, on some level, you know, anyone who looks at this problem agrees has to happen. The practical logistics of it are very daunting. What would be a signal to you that um, that we're kind of on the right path? Um, you know, I mean, like the costs are coming down. Maybe um, you're starting to see electric vehicles that are getting towards what people might call affordable, um, at least in the US. Uh, are, are there other things that you'd look for to say, like, you know, maybe we will actually be able to do this by 2050? Well, I look, you know, I look every year at the, a lot of different groups, look at the carbon budget for the world. And, you know, it's not something that you can go um, to a single source and say, okay, how much carbon did we emit? Because every single car, every single 
uh, you know, air conditioning unit is on some level emitting carbon, but you can aggregate this data because you know, you can see how much oil was refined, how much coal was, you know, mined, and you can get a pretty good idea of global emissions. Um, and when I see that number consistently decline year by year in a significant way, I will say the world is on the right track. And until then, all of this is unfortunately, you know, it's, it's, it may be a positive sign, but it's not yet a positive step. No. And I think things like the the um, carbon removal are prob probably then become even more and more necessary each year that that doesn't happen um, because, you know, we, it, as we fail to reduce our emissions um, as a planet, then, you know, we need more and more tools to, to be able to get there. Exactly. So um, one of the other um, topics that you talked about is kind of that break glass in case of emergency um, thing, which is solar geoengineering. Um, talk, talk about that and like, what, what does that mean if, if that's something that we think at some point in the future we're gonna have to, have to do to lower the temperature um, here on the planet? Well, solar geoengineering, as you say, it really is this like, um, you know, Hail Mary pass kind of idea. Um, and it's a pretty simple idea. Um, and interestingly enough, when I was researching the book, one of the things I, I discovered was that it was an idea that was proposed right away. As soon as people realized we were heating up the earth by pouring in a lot of CO2, they immediately proposed, well, maybe we can cool it down uh, by doing this. And this is to, um, basically create fake volcanoes to spew a lot of um, something and volcanoes use sulfur dioxide. They spew a lot of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere. So it shoots all the way up above the lower level of the atmosphere and just sort of the middle of the atmosphere. And that drifts around, it forms these droplets that are called aerosols, these little tiny droplets. They're very reflective and that's why you get uh, those these great sunsets after big volcanic eruption, and you get a temporary global cooling, and and we know that we have actually measured that. Like after Mount Pinatubo in uh, 1991, scientists very carefully measured the effect on global temperatures, and they were depressed for about a year afterwards. And um, that's because you're you're literally bouncing more sunlight back to space. It's not hitting the Earth, so your less direct sunlight is hitting the Earth, and um, the idea behind solar geoengineering is we, we, instead of waiting for a volcano to do that, uh, let's take matters into our own hands. We would, I think that, that the theory goes, we would sort of create a fleet of very sophisticated aircraft. They would be, be able to fly it into the stratosphere uh, and they would carry a very heavy payload. So they'd have to be engineered, but I don't think anyone thinks that's really a barrier. Uh, and they would pour something, sulfur dioxide is one possibility, but other materials people have suggested include just calcium carbonate. Another suggestion has been made, tiny diamond, diamond dust, uh, manufactured diamonds, or some kind of designer particle that has yet to be you know, created, but would be man-made. We would put it up there and we would have to um, keep replenishing that because it, they would, these particles would fall out of the stratosphere after a year or so, the way it does after a volcano. But we could do that, theoretically, in theory. We could do that and we would create this cooling effect which could either counteract climate change or could counteract part of climate change. Um, and here the idea is you'd still have to cut emissions. If you, if you continue to just you know, fill the atmosphere with carbon dioxide, you have to put more and more stuff of, this stuff into the atmosphere. So the idea is, well, let's use it as this sort of transition moment as we're bringing emissions down and we will get to a point of maximum risk, maximum climate risk, and that risk may be very high. Uh, can we sort of cut the top off that risk curve with geoengineering? Now, the timing on that, you know, is still very long. I mean, we're still talking about decades to centuries that you would have to do it because of the way that carbon lingers in the atmosphere. So these are huge technical, political, 
uh, you know, challenges, uh, societal challenges that, uh, you know, would have to be either answered or just, you know, sort of plowed ahead. Uh, but there's a lot of pretty serious talk about it right now. It, it sounds like the um, having, you know, kind of putting the, the uh, whatever into the air, you know, and kind of reducing the temperature, but you have to keep replenishing it. Sounds a lot like Southern Louisiana, where you keep moving the dirt and moving the dirt and moving the dirt. And if you ever stop, everything just kind of falls apart without um, real, real solutions. Yes, exactly. And it's really raised, you know, there are many people, um, I mean, there are many people who consider this you know, the worst possible idea and that even to discuss it is the worst possible idea because it ha might have, could have the effect of licensing, you know, increasing emissions or, or, or sustaining emissions, even at the level that we're at, you know, you don't even have to increase them, you just keep them where they are. And, and it's, you know, awful enough, I can assure you. And, um, and so as if this would sort of take the social pressure off really, really radically cutting emissions. On the other side are people who will say, well, you know, be that as it may, we are not radically cutting emissions. And you may decide when you get some, you know, humanitarian or ecological catastrophe uh, that you need this. And if you need it, you, you should know if it could even work or not. You might want to know that. You know? So, um, so these are two camps who really um, don't like each other uh, and are very vociferous in their um, in their debate. And there was going to be the very first sort of rigorous test of not geoengineering. It was going to be a tiny little test to just test some of the equipment. Basically, it was like an equipment test with a balloon, a scientific balloon that was going to go. Um, take up some equipment that some guys at Harvard have designed. Uh, and it was going to take place in Northern Sweden this summer. Um, but there was so much opposition in Sweden that it has been postponed perhaps forever. I don't know. Not a good omen for future testing or research on, on the topic. Well, interestingly, at more or less the same moment that um, that this test was being suspended, the National Academy of Sciences came out with a report recommending, I think it was a hundred million dollar research effort. Um, so I think it is a research effort that's actually going to get more and more funding, potentially US government funding, um, but then you're gonna have, you're gonna continue to have the sort of on the ground. And a lot of that will be done at computer, you know, in front of someone's computer. But then when you get to the actual, well, let's put something up into the atmosphere or stratosphere, uh, can you overcome that po political opposition? And I don't know the answer to that. So um, coming back down from the air to the land, um, you talked about uh, invasive species and toads in Australia. Um, and some of the research that's going on with that. Can you can you tell that story and 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 kind of how that came about? Well, the invasive toad story is a um, kind of incredible story. It's really famous if you're um, an Australian, and many Americans have heard about it too. And the story is basically the um, uh, the cane toad, as it's known, is this huge, huge toad. Very, you know, just. Uh, almost ungodly huge and um, native to South and Central America. And it was exported around the world uh, in this kind of crazy idea that it was going to eat the grubs that were uh, gnawing on sugarcane. And, and it probably never did any good for the sugarcane, but it became highly invasive in, in a lot of different parts of the world, but especially in Australia where it encountered you know, basically no, no native resistance <laughs> and it is still spreading. It was first brought to Australia in the 19, 1930s. It is still continuing to increase its territory. Um, and the problem with the toad, the reason why Australians hate the toads uh, is that they're very toxic. They have these two glands behind their shoulders. Um, and when they feel threatened, 
they sort of mix up this uh, white milky substance uh, that is, um, it could kill you. I mean, if, if humans eat cane toads, which they occasionally make a mistake of doing, they die. And if your dog bites a cane toad, it probably dies. And, and all sorts of native wildlife in Australia that makes the mistake of trying to prey on cane toads die. And so there have been many, many, many efforts to try to get rid of them, which include everything from bashing them with golf clubs. I mean, people uh, will do anything, will run them over lawnmowers. They have no mercy toward cane toads. And the latest uh, effort involves genetic engineering um, because we now have these phenomenal tools that can potentially either interfere with the toad's toxicity and those toads ha have already been engineered. There's already been a batch of them engineered. They're sitting in a laboratory. They've not been let out. Um, but that's a sort of proven thing. You could, you could make them less toxic by gene editing. And you could, in theory, once again, and this hasn't been done yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if it is soon, you could genetically engineer them so they have trouble reproducing. And then the question becomes, and so you, you could cut down on their numbers. And then the question becomes, you know, are we going to let these creatures out onto the landscape? And that is, I think, a question, uh, not just vis-a-vis -vis the cane toad, but vis-a-vis -vis a lot of organisms, genetically modified organisms, that we're going to be facing uh, more and more uh, in the US and around the world because it has become so much easier with CRISPR uh, to do that sort of thing. And you know, on gen genetically modified plants, you know, we've been having that debate for several decades now. Um, I mean, I think at one point, 98% of sugar beets were genetically modified and the ones that weren't were, were not surviving. And so most of the sugar that we're eating is genetically modified, for example. But with, with all these new, with, with CRISPR, you know, kind of the new technologies that where you can actually go in and edit DNA and change for specific, you know, purposes like, like the cane toad. I mean, how, do, how do we draw, like, how do you draw a line of, you know, what is acceptable, what's not, you know, at some point, do we genetically modify, um, you know, I, I know there's genetically modified coral that's being researched and looked at, you know, to survive in warmer ocean temperatures. Do we do that for animals and humans even, um, you know, as he, as you know, the heat in Portland hits 116 um, and, you know, over a hundred people died from that last week. Um, how, how do we figure that how do we untangle that knot? Well, I I don't have a great answer to that. There's a, there's a couple of things that I will say. One one is just to tell another story, and that involves the American chestnut tree, which um, was killed off. It wasn't just decimated; it was annihilated uh, in the middle of the 20th century by a fungal disease that was imported on Asian chestnut trees, and many many years of effort went into sort of trying to crossbreed a tree that was resistant and um, and they failed. Uh, and a scientist at, in Syracuse, whom I've met, a guy named Bill Powell, um, developed a genetically modified chestnut tree. It has one gene imported from wheat that allows it to fight off this fungal pathogen. And I have seen the seedlings that are sitting there uh, in Syracuse. Um, at the School of Forestry there, and uh, they have applied for permission to, you know, send them out into the world. Uh, that is wending its way through the federal bureaucracy, I believe, even as we speak. Now, what is your response to that? And, you know, your gut response to that might be, you know, that's, that's terrible. I, I don't think those trees should be, should be let out there. Um, but you have to weigh that against no chestnut trees. You know, it's, it's, a very, uh, it's a very tough choice. And I personally, at this point, uh, you know, it really changed the characteristic character of our Northeastern forests here when, when chestnut trees were obliterated. I it, am just slightly too young to have seen them, but, um, but so I can't tell you what it looked like, but I can tell you 
uh, that ash, ash trees now, we're losing all our ash trees to emerald ash forest. So the Northeastern forests are really under siege and are we just going to let them, you know, fall victim to one problem after another or are we going to use, you know, our genetic engineering tools to try to save them? And these are really, really hard questions. I don't, I don't have the answer. But another problem that you run into, just a sheer practical problem is, uh, you know, you say, could we genetically modify organisms? Could we genetically modify ourselves to, you know, survive on warmer temperatures? Um, the world is moving really fast. Temperatures are rising really fast. Uh, you know, humans have a long gestation time and they, uh, these experiments are very, even just the experiments, uh, when you're not involving, you know, mice, mice experiments, even mice experiments take, you know, months and months, but they, it's not, it's not as easy as snapping your fingers and saying, when you are dealing with any living creature, which does have to go through developmental, before you even know, you know, what, what you've accomplished. Um, so these are very, very time consuming and I don't, and expensive. And I don't, I see the world changing so fast that I'm not sure we're gonna have an opportunity uh, to do a lot of those um, experiments. And so I guess the, the, uh, the moral here is that we, we have to be much more diligent in the decisions we make the first time around instead of having to kind of cover band-aids over band-aid over band-aid um, on, uh, on the mistakes that we've, we've made. Yes, exactly. The, 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 the problem that we've gotten ourselves into is that we um, you know, have done so many different things from introducing you know, species all around the world totally inadvertently to changing the atmosphere inadvertently you know, it's very hard to put that genie back in those genies back in the bottle. And it's very hard to say, well, you know, next time around, let's just be more thoughtful. That is, you know, absolutely the message that we should get from this. But meanwhile, we are faced with dealing with problems of, on a massive scale, uh, where it's too late to say, well, you know, you really should have thought about before you know, before we started burning fossil fuels, we're, we're really way too deep into this by now. So I want to invite um, Crystal back to ask questions from the audience. Um, Crystal? Okay, great. Thank you. We do have um, our first question is, uh, Elizabeth, you write, it's going to be more control, not so much the control of nature, but the control of the control of nature. In thinking about this control, how do you incorporate justice and ensure that geoengineering conversations include those that will be most impacted by climate change, but are often most left out of these conversations? Well, I, I think that's a really you know profound question, and it's you know another one that I, you know, personally don't have the answer for. I think that um, all of these conversations obviously should be, uh, should have equity at their center or, or, or as we, you know, grope our way to the next round of interventions or whatever you want to call them, uh, we should be constantly focusing on how these will impact you know, everyone, including those who did the least to cause the problems in the first place. Um, you know, unfortunately, that tends not to be how politics works, either at a national level or at an international level. Um, you know, certainly there are many people uh, pushing for that. There are whole groups, for example, in the solar geoengineering world who are working to sort of bring the global south into this, you know, quote unquote conversation as a very you know, so far it's a pretty limited conversation. Um, but, you know, I, I don't have like, okay, this is the way we're going to, you know, make a better world. Um, but I certainly agree with the implicit uh, idea of the question that, that those concerns should be central, absolutely. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is your piece in the New Yorker last month talked about the astounding biodiversity of the deep ocean floor in the context of potential 
for advancing deep seabed mining to get minerals to produce climate fighting tech like vehicle batteries and social or and solar panels. Um, how do we set up a system to compare this risk to marine biodiversity alongside the potential detriments of acquiring these minerals from other land-based sources? That's another great question. Uh, and I wish I had a great answer for it. Um, I mean, that piece just for, um, you know, people didn't see it, uh, it was about, um, there's a lot of minerals on the, on the bed of the oceans. They, they take the form generally of these bl black lumps that look like potatoes. Um, they took, they're called polymetallic nodules. And they probably took millions of years to form. Um, and they, they contain a lot of um, these rare earth minerals that we need for, for batteries and for, sort of this next generation of, of clean tech, uh, clean tech, but the risks of uh, risks to the ocean, to the creatures on the ocean floor, to the oceans in general of, of mining them is, are, are severe. And many, many marine scientists are arguing, argue that we should not, you know, go down that road. Our, our record is so bad <laughs> on land, we should not be going to mine. Uh, the deep seas and the question of the trade-off and how you would um, really um, rigorously, uh, you know, assess the trade-offs. Yes, we need you know certain um, minerals. Let's say, let's say, you, let's say you decide there's no way to make you know thin film solar panels uh, without some of these minerals that are 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 in pretty abundant on the ocean floor and not very abundant on land. Um, and then you decide, but the risk to marine life are X and Y, and then you have to have some system for comparing them. And once again, I can unfortunately assure you that that is not the way these decisions are going to be made. Um, there is a body called the International Seabed Authority. It's based in Jamaica. It's a very kind of weird secretive body, but it was formed by the UN under this law of the sea treaty, which convention, which the US is not part of, I should also add, we have not ratified it, one of the few countries that hasn't. And they are going to come up with the sort of rules for seabed mining under a lot of pressure from companies and countries that want to share in the proceeds from this mining. So we could in potentially in theory design a better, a much better system, but this is a system we have. Uh, and I think that people should be quite worried that those decisions are not going to be made uh, in a way that carefully weighs all of the potential ecological good and harm. Thank you. Uh, the next question, there are a lot of projects dealing with sequestration of CO2 into the earth. One of the most favorable of these is the use of mantle peri, uh, Period, um, periodotite with, um, with which CO2 bonds. Uh, that has the advantage that the reaction goes faster with higher temperature, which increases with depth. But this requires a lot of digging to expose the rocks which are on the surface of several places, including Oman and Canada. Would it not be a good idea to encourage large scale funding of such projects? Well, I think we get into these really complicated questions once again, and I don't, you know, fortunately, I guess you could say, I'm not going to be the one to make these decisions, but um, a lot of these projects for carbon dioxide removal, uh, unfortunately, all of them, well, not a lot of them, all of them require energy. Um, they, they require a lot of energy. So if we decide, for example, we're going to dig up rocks that have not yet equilibrated with the atmosphere, we're going to you know, spread them out, and then we're, and we're going to grind them up, and we're going to spread them out, uh, and they're going to suck up CO2, which is you know, definitely theoretically possible. Um, we have to ask, once again, the, the trade-offs here, the uh, environmental trade-offs. And right now, uh, you know, if you were to send a lot of, you know, diesel equipment in to do that, you would be releasing a lot of CO2 in the process. And even if you were 
uh, sucking up more than you are expending, you do have to ask, is that really a worthwhile thing to do at this point? A lot of these projects sort of presuppose some moment when all of our energy is already carbon free. We're going to have so much carbon free energy. We're going to use the excess, you know, to do all these things. And I hope, I hope we get there. Um, but the idea of, you know, digging up a lot of Oman right now, for example, which is, you know, one of the possibilities on the table and spreading it over, you know, large parts of the world, uh, that does raise the question of, you know, the law of unintended consequences. Are, are you sort of doing more harm than good? And I, I don't know the answer to that. Once again, it would be very good to have, you know, um, to think, to imagine that these decisions were gonna be made in a very careful way that, you know, weighed apples against apples as it were. But unfortunately, I, I don't think we have a mechanism to do that yet. And I would, I would hesitate at this point to say, okay, well, let's just go out there and dig up Oman. I, I'm not sure we know enough to know that that is um, worth, worthwhile. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what constitutes a humanitarian or ecological crisis to you at this point? It feels like the Colorado River Basin that we are already moving into um, an ecological crisis, but slowly enough that even current climate deniers can and are actually still denying it. Uh, this slow motion, but increasingly faster unfolding ecological story isn't even happening at a, at a fast enough clip to constitute a crisis or even an acknowledgement from the deniers. How will um, we be motivated going forward? Well, the story, I mean, for you and Aspen, uh, you know, the story of the Colorado River and what's happening to the Colorado River, what's going to happen to the Colorado River is, you know, definitely, a, um, there's this phrase, which, which I use in the book, it's used about um, the Mississippi Delta, it's called a, a coupled human and natural system. The Mississippi Delta is a coupled human and natural system. It's no longer Mississippi flowing free and flooding when it wants to. It's Mississippi in a straitjacket and humans trying to manipulate it, you know, to prevent all the land from uh, disappearing. The Colorado River is the most heavily controlled, litigated, regulated, you know, uh, dammed up uh, river in the world, perhaps. Um, so, you know, very little of the Colorado fro flows free at this point, and most of the water is, you know, as everyone knows, doesn't reach uh, the sea anymore. Uh, it gets used before that. Um, so part of this, you know, catastrophe that's unfolding slowly and but, but more and more quickly uh, is, is, is human made. Most of it is human made. You know, yes, the flow of the Colorado, I believe the figure is that the flow of the Colorado has probably shrunk by about 20% owing to climate change. And it's going to continue to shrink. I think, you know, you can bank on that. Um, but the way that we have manipulated the Colorado and the way that we overuse the Colorado is, is on us. Um, so when does it become a humanitarian disaster? I mean, the good news here, if you, if you want some good news, is a lot of the Colorado River water is going to, you know, raise alfalfa to, you know, feed horses or cows or whatever. Uh, and we could stop doing that. So I think we will stop doing that before we let no water come out of the tap. I hope that's true. Um, but there is going to be a huge fight and it's going to, you know, occupy the rest of the lives of everyone here today over what to do about the Colorado, uh, because it is going to be, um, politically incredibly difficult to sort out this mess. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, I'm a sophomore in high school and I love everything about being in nature and I want to make this a career path. What fields will be most important for climate change in the next 10 years? Wow, that's a good question. I, I, I hesitate to give you know <laughs> career advice except to say, um, that I think that, you know, we're in sort of an all hands on deck uh, situation. And if you love being out in nature and want to 
um, make a career in that, there is a, there is, there are definitely very, very useful things that you could do as a, as a field scientist, as somebody who is out there looking at the impacts of climate change and thinking about how we could minimize those impacts. Um, I don't have like, you know, the three steps that you should take to get from here to there, but I can assure you that we need you. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, there's been an enduring tension in environmentalism between a technology will save us philosophy and a return to nature school of thought. Where do you fall on this spectrum? Do you think the technology camp has won? Well, that's, <laughs> that's really the question um, at the heart uh, of my latest book. And I think that the answer I, you know, emotionally, uh, I am on the, you know, return to, uh, return to nature school. But I think that um, we have to be frank and say that we're kind of beyond that. We're, we're uh, in a really difficult situation where we have 8 billion people on the planet. Uh, and presumably we agree that everyone has, you know, a right to eat and sh to shelter and to certain, you know, basics of life. Now, many of us in the world live way beyond that. Um, but trying to feed, just simply trying to feed 8 billion people is a task that uh, you know depends now for example on uh, synthetic fertilizers you know we're not going back from synthetic fertilizers we can't we simply cannot feed the population so I think we're between a rock and a hard place and a lot of the easy answers all of the easy answers on the one hand the let's just go back and you know live on small farms and uh, you know answer uh, that's not going to work and the techno optimist, oh, well, let's just, you know, if, if, if things go wrong, we're just gonna fill, you know, the, the atmosphere, the, the stratosphere with uh, sulfur dioxide. Uh, it's not clear that's gonna work. Uh, so I don't think there are easy answers. And part of the motivation for writing the book was to sort of uh, lay that out. Now, that being said, I do want to say for the book, and I know it always sounds weird when I present this unbelievably gloomy uh, portrait, um, is uh, I like to think that the book is kind of funny. It's really a dark comedy. It's basically how did a species uh, get itself into such a big mess? Um, Thank you. Um, I think this is our last question. Um, what do you think about Biden's efforts to address climate change so far? What should the U.S. be doing while we have a president who's willing to take actionable steps on climate change? Well, that's a great question, and um, we could talk about that for hours. But I was very heartened by some of the things that Biden did right off the bat. He signed a slew of executive orders that were really good. He hired a lot of really good people. I am less heartened when I look at what is gonna come out of this infrastructure package, and I'm actually quite worried that we're gonna get all the worst parts of the infrastructure package, which is basically roads, you know, which are, you know, okay, we need to repair our roads, I buy that, but, um, and not any of the climate, not any of the important measures that we're supposed to, uh, at the same time, make sure that we were building smarter infrastructure and infrastructure for the future. So I think that, you know, while we have an administration that's willing to do something, and I, I do think that the administration is willing to do something, we have a Senate where you can't get anything through and, it's a, and we have a Supreme Court that's a disaster. So they are in a very difficult situation and I wish them absolutely the best of luck. Thank you. Uh, well, that brings us to the end of our hour. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Elizabeth Colbert, for your time uh, that you've spent with us today. Thanks for writing this book. And uh, thanks to our audience for tuning in. 
Um, all of our events, uh, community events this summer are free and open to the public. So uh, if you are in a position to donate, please click on the chat. Um, please join us for the rest of our summer of programming. A full listing is on our website at aspeninstitute.org slash Aspen events. Um, you can register now for all of our in-person events, um, which start next week. We've changed it so that you now can, uh, anyone can register now for any of those in-person events. So I hope you'll do that. And thanks for joining us today.